sharing his vast experience of autism with us. And Chris was a very good friend of uh, research autism, and was a very close personal friend and colleague of Dr. Lauren Wing. And was, Chris was one of our uh, family members of our international uh, committee. He was also one of the speakers uh, that we heard about this morning at the first autism and girls conference that we held back in 2009. Uh, Chris is the Professor of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at Rottenberg University in Sweden, an honorary professor of the Institute of Child Health here in London, and has a number of overseas appointments, visiting Professor of Bergen, New York, Odin Surf, St George's University of London, San Francisco, Glasgow, and So there's quite a list. Um, this was extensive research um, that significantly contributed not just to the world of autism, but to the area of child and adolescent psychiatry and developmental medicine more generally, in areas such as ADHD, epilepsy, intellectual disabilities, oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, Tourette syndrome, and anorexia nervosa. And he is cited as the most productive researcher in the world of autism. So I'll say no more. Let's, let's have a good practice. Well done, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Richard, and uh, I can only say that I miss Laura enormously and I would have loved for her to be able to hear this talk because I know that she would at least say, well, didn't I say so? <laughs> and um, actually, much of what I'm going to present owes uh, to, to Lorna because in our discussions over the years, uh, I re realized with time that it was many of those discussions that actually led to a conceptual shift in my own thinking. Uh, and in a way, Lorna had always thought along the lines that I'm going to be presenting today. Uh, but I coined new terms for some of the things that we were talking about over the years. Uh, and uh, uh, some of these terms will probably be unfamiliar to, to some of you, and some of you will think, what's that? That's nothing new, and that's why I call the presentation Autism Plus new thinking about old findings, because actually what I'm going to be telling you is not new. It's not something we didn't know. Uh, we just didn't look at it in this particular way. I also have to say that I've got a terrible uh, back problem, and I might suddenly just, you know, shout out uh, from pain. If I don't move at all, uh, I'm fine. So, uh, but I'm on painkillers, and I'm, I'm a bit dazed, so maybe some of the things I'll be saying I will have to regret. Um, so, um, Autism Plus uh, is something that has grown out of uh, our thinking in the Gothenburg Center uh, around uh, things that we now refer to as essence, early symptomatic syndromes eliciting neurodevelopmental clinical examinations. And all the sort of words in that uh, quite horrible string of words um, are very important. These are early onset symptoms and syndromes uh, they show in early life, and early life meaning in the first three, four, five years of life. Um, but they may not necessarily be diagnosed as anything in particular, or be diagnosed as only one syndrome, when in fact you're dealing with a holistic uh, pro a problem that's uh, um, affecting various areas of neurodevelopment. Uh, and so the point of this whole concept is that people need to start thinking about if it is sort of autism, if it is ADHD, if it is one of these named syndromes, uh, what else? Uh, because there always is something else, uh, at least if you're clinically impaired. So early symptomatic syndromes eliciting your developmental clinical examinations. These are not children that we just screen for and then say there's something wrong. These are children who already at this point in time come to services they come to speech and language therapists, or to GPs, or community pediatricians, or to uh, ear, nose, and throat, throat specialists, audiologists, uh, physiotherapists, uh, occupational therapists, child psychiatrists even, even though they're usually, you know, just 
stand off and say, that's not our field. Uh, we're not dealing with this. We're dealing with much older people. Uh, but young children actually do come, are presented to various specialists in various different fields. And depending on who sees them, they'll get one of the labels uh, on one of their problems. For instance, if they come to a speech and language therapist because of language delay, it's very likely, actually more than 80% likely, that any child of two and a half who is referred to a speech and language therapist will be diagnosed with a language disorder. The vast majority of children who are referred actually do have big problems, um, and so they get the diagnosis of speech and language disorder. If you follow such a child up five years later, you'll find that in 70 to 80% of the cases diagnosed with language disorder, there will be more problems than just language. There will be a very often ADHD, very often clumsiness and perceptual problems, very often autistic features, sometimes to the degree that people would actually say, this is autism, or this is Asperger's, or this is uh, in the old, uh, atypical autism world, when that still existed. Um, and um, people don't recognize from the beginning that this child already at two and a half does have all the problems. It's just, I'm just looking at this particular thing. And we have exactly the same problem when a child is presented with query autism, uh, and people, you know, dig out the ADI and the ADOS and just say, well, he meets criteria, so it's autism, or no, doesn't meet criteria, so it's not autism. And all those children who are referred with a suspicion of autism, virtually all of them, do have something, even the ones that don't meet ADI and ADOS criteria, or clinical criteria for that matter, uh, but people then have it in their heads that my uh, sort of task at my remit is just to decide whether it is autism or not, not to look at the whole child. We know that all the conditions listed here on this slide are predictors of academic failure, all of them. They will predict, uh, if you don't recognize it early on, if you don't do anything about it, they will all lead to a huge proportion of academic failure. Social exclusion, substance use later in life, unfortunately, and particularly, of course, for the group labeled ADHD. Psychiatric disorder, all of these uh, problem types will lead on to later diagnoses of psychiatric disorder. But the problem hasn't really changed. It's just people will now recognize that, oh, he's depressed, so it must be depression. Or she's not eating, so it must be anorexia. Uh, and unfortunately also remaining empathy problems and sometimes antisocial lifestyles. This is true definitely for ADHD, uh, with or without oppositional defiant disorder. It affects about five, six, seven percent of the general population of children worldwide. It's not a US phenomenon. If people look carefully in this country, it is at that same level. If people look carefully in Scotland or Sweden or Norway or Australia, it's the same sort of level of, of prevalence. Of course, depending on exactly how you uh, cut the, uh, the cake, uh, with regard to diagnostic criteria, you'll get a little bit higher or a little bit lower prevalence rates. Specific language impairment is also about 5% of the population, but it's never specific. And so the term is just ridiculous. And of course, in the new DSM-5, it's not called specific anymore. Uh, which is a good thing. Uh, but we did a study many years ago when we were trying to find the right contrast groups for a study of children with epilepsy. And we were looking for children with specific language impairment. And speech therapists told us, oh, it's so easy to have. They're all over the place. We see them everywhere. So that's not going to be a problem. But it took 10 years to collect a group of 10 children with specific language impairment. Uh, that they, they had only language impairment. All the others had something else on this list. Developmental coordination disorder is the most underdiagnosed of all the conditions on this list, and people don't understand the need to recognize motor control and perceptual problems in young children, and the need to actually do something about it. A lot can be done, but it's, the research that has been done is mostly in the occupational therapy literature, and so most people who work with these children don't know about that. But you can actually do a lot to uh, counter the negative effects of development coordination disorder of being clumsy and ill-coordinated. And it's about 5% as well. 
of the general population. But if you group, group those three, ADHD, so-called specific language impairment, and DCD, you only end up with about 7 to 8 percent of the population. And if you look at the actual numbers, you would have thought it would be 15 to 17 percent. But it's because they're so, as it were, comorbid. The awful word comorbid has sort of spread like cancer into the community, and everybody accepts it. So I'm going to use it, uh, but it's it's not okay. Uh, comorbid is not a right word for these things. Um, it's coexisting problems in children with a neurodevelopmental type of uh, problem, uh, and um, ADHD, specific language impairment, and DCD are so often comorbid with each other. They overlap to the extent that the actual number of children affected by one of those. Uh, is only in the order of about 78%, not 15 to 17. For instance, about 50% of children with ADHD also meet full criteria for developmental coordination disorder. About 40% of all children with autism meet the same criteria. Uh, about 80% of children with specific language impairment have very marked features of developmental coordination disorder, and at least 50% of the group do meet criteria for, for the disorder. And this is the point with the whole essence and later autism plus concept, that um, these disorders or these problems overlap always to the extent that you will need to understand that if you find one of them, you will have to go looking for the others. You can't just accept the diagnosis of ADHD without having looked for DCD or language impairment. You can't accept the diagnosis actually of autism without looking for the other problems on the list. Intellectual disability is about 2% of the general population, although people increasingly say it's about 1%, and I don't know how they can get that into their heads, uh, because if you still uh, define intellectual uh, developmental disorder or intellectual disability as testing below a certain level on an IQ test and being uh, adaptively impaired by being uh, intellectually uh, uh, low functioning, of course, it has to be in the order of 2% if the IQ test and the adaptive functioning test is uh, normed in, in the right way. Autism spectrum disorder, I think it's appropriate to say it's probably around 1 to 1.2%. We published a paper in the British Medical Journal a few months ago showing the big Swedish twin study that there has been no increase whatsoever in the autism phenotype in the general population of Swedish twins. That's a study that currently encompasses about 40,000 twins, uh, and they have been followed over many years, uh, from the beginning of the 2000s, uh, <coughs> the 10-year period, every year, the rate of the autism phenotype uh, is almost exactly 1%, 0 0.96 to 1.06. And there's no real fluctuation, no tendency for an increase whatsoever. But at the same time, registered diagnoses of autism have gone up from virtually zero uh, to uh, in Stockholm and in Korea, around 3% of the general population. In the face of the phenotype having been stable over all that time, which of course uh, begs the question, what is it that makes people diagnose autism rather than, is, is it really autism? Um, it's the impairing symptoms, I would say, of the other conditions with some autistic features that lead people more and more to say, this is autism, and that's all it is. And so people think that the rate is going up and up and up. Uh, I think in the vast majority of cases uh, or countries, there is no increase in uh, the rate of autism, except in subgroups. They, for instance, the prematurity subgroup must be growing because we know that Children who are extremely premature are at much higher risk of developing autism than other children. And because the rate of extreme prematurity and survivors of extreme prematurity is going up and up and up, of course there will be a growing group with a combination of prematurity and autism. But on the other hand, there are other things that have disappeared completely, like rubella embryopathy, uh, which in the past, when I started out in the field, was quite a common cause of autism and is no longer. So there will be fluctuations uh, depending on these uh, etiological factors. But overall, the sort of autism phenotype in society is not becoming, at least not according to this very large study 
in Sweden uh, increasing. Tourette syndrome is about 1% of the population. Reactive attachment disorder also probably about 1%. And if you look carefully at children who are diagnosed with reactive attachment disorder, as we've done in, in our Glasgow studies, you'll find they all have these essence type problems. They all have high rates of ADHD, of autism spectrum disorder, of language disorder. They have even higher rates of language disorder than children with autism. Uh, and um, there's nothing in reactive attachment disorder that wouldn't suggest that this is also a neurodevelopmental disorder. That's not to say that the um, sort of experience of the child doesn't uh, play a role in the symptomatology that makes you diagnose reactive attachment disorder. But children who are diagnosed in services with reactive attachment disorder need to be looked at always from the point of view could it also be ADHD? Could it also be autism? Could it also be language disorder? And if so, what should we do about that? It doesn't help to just think about attachment uh, in that group. Uh, and this is currently uh, quite a big problem universally, that people seem to make the decision that if it's reactive attachment disorder, if you can diagnose that in a child, then you don't need to think about neurodevelopment at all. And the other way around too, if you diagnose autism, you cannot even think uh, the possibility that there might, in a few cases, be anything to do with attachment as well. So I think both sides have to come together and think about how do we deal with this in, in clinical practice. For instance, uh, children uh, under the Protection Act or, or children taken into care, they all need, from the very early uh, years, as soon as they're taken into care, they would need a neurodevelopmental assessment, all of them. Uh, we're doing a big study in Glasgow of 500 uh, children who are taken into care, and in the first 100, there's not a single one who doesn't have a neurodevelopmental problem from the very beginning. Uh, this could be caused by all sorts of things like maltreatment or genetic factors or whatever, but it, it's still a problem, and you can't just overlook it by saying, no, no, that, that's reactive attachment disorder, so it, it's nothing to do with any of the other neurodevelopmental problems. And then there is the concept, as I think you've already heard about, of uh, extreme or pathological demand avoidance, uh, which is quite common in all these populations. Uh, it's not extremely common, but it is quite common uh, in, in all the various essence populations, it seems, from the clinical point of view and from the point of view of a few research studies. <coughs> And selective mutism is also a so-called disorder or diagnosis uh, that would have you think about, could it also be one of the other things on the list? It's not okay, I think, anymore to say this is selective mutism, that's what it is. Um, very often, a child with selective mutism has um, specific, so-called specific language impairment, developmental coordination disorder, autism spectrum features, or even uh, full-blown autism, but it's not diagnosed because you say, well, it's selective mutism. I put a number of things in brackets here. Borderline intellectual functioning, behavioral phenotype syndromes, neurological syndromes, and pediatric acute onset neuropsychiatric syndrome, because they are not the sort of presentations in themselves that we call in neurodevelopment uh, problems, but they suddenly contribute to the clinical picture. Uh, and uh, if people don't understand that many of the kids that you see in any practice that sees a lot of kids, uh, some of the kids <coughs> have borderline intellectual disability, and that's uh, one of their biggest problems in our society, that they cannot cope with the mainstream school type demands, for instance, that they're being bullied because they appear to be slow, etc. Um, and people have to start thinking about uh, the fact that cognitive dysfunction more generally or low uh, cognitive ability is something that will lead in itself to a lot of reactions on the part of other people and uh, also to things like depression, anxiety, etc. And of course many of the children with, for instance, uh, autism have borderline intellectual function. <coughs> They're very often referred to as high functioning which of course isn't uh, a good uh, sort of category in that sense because they're only high functioning in the sense that they're more high functioning than those who have severe intellectual disability. Uh, behavioral phenotype syndromes uh, such as Pregel X, tuberous sclerosis, 
Q11 or Q13. Uh, the lesions are, um, as, as a group together, they're now um, larger than 1%, they're more like 1.4% of the general population of children. Uh, and uh, almost every week there is a new syndrome uh, discovered that's linked to a particular set of genes or one gene. Um, and also things like fetal alcohol syndrome and valproic acid syndrome, uh, they have almost been forgotten in the 80s when we looked at this uh, in, in several studies. It was as it were popular, almost as popular as autism is now. Uh, and so the people looked for it, but people have given up looking for fetal alcohol syndrome. And it's actually quite common. Uh, so the rate, if we include things like fetal alcohol syndrome or valproic acid syndrome, the rate is even higher than, than 1% uh, or 1.6 or 8% even. Uh, epilepsy and other neurological so-called disorders. Uh, of course, overlap with all of these other uh, things on the list. Uh, and um, epilepsy usually is associated with ADHD or autism or language disorder or DCD or intellectual disability or borderline intellectual function. In fact, in a study we did in Sussex just recently, a population study of epilepsy showed that 80% met criteria for a diagnosis and 98% had either one of these other diagnoses or um, uh, academic underachievement. So not that there, was a, there were only one, one or two children in the whole study of whom you could say they only had epilepsy. And of course, people working in the field of epilepsy uh, tend to uh, say, just like people in the field of autism, that, well, this is epilepsy. And as people in the field of autism say, this is autism, explaining everything with that label. Uh, and we're just concluding a study on cerebral palsy. Very surprisingly, nobody has done a big population study on cerebral palsy with regard to things like ADHD and autism. There are a few small scale studies in, in the past, but virtually everyone with cerebral palsy, just like virtually everyone with epilepsy, uh, has more than, uh, than, than just that label. Uh, and it's uh, necessary that people shift their ideas about these things. Pan's pediatric acute onset neuropsychiatric syndrome can present as any of the things on, on this list, usually a combination of virtually all of them. Uh, but the difference between uh, Pan's and the other things on the list is that it happens overnight or over a period of a few weeks. So it's of acute onset, and some families actually do have children who have acute onset of all these types of problems. But most of us uh, have uh, sort of not really believed that. We've always been looking for there must be something uh, other uh, that was going on long before uh, this acute onset. But there is a small group where, where it's clearly of acute onset, and this group needs to be looked into much more carefully than has been the case up to now. So if you, if you were sort of accept the concept that these, all these disorders overlap uh, and we could just for you know, having an easy term for them, call them essence, we could also call them your developmental disorders. Um, what would the symptoms be that would make you think maybe it's something in that group? Well, major childhood onset symptoms uh, is what we're talking about. We're not talking about uh, like a minor problem with sleep or anything like that. Uh, these have been major problems going on for a long, long time, uh, usually more than six months, or if of extreme abrupt onset, you could also perhaps include them in the group. And they lead to concern, uh, major concern, and to specialist consultation. So we're not talking about all the children that you could uh, potentially find through screening of the general population. They come to a specialist in the early years, uh, but any specialist that sees children. And it could be in the field of general development, it could be in the field of motor coordination or communication, activity, impulsivity, attention. Very often children who have attentional problems in the first three, four years of life are referred for hearing evaluation and people say there's nothing wrong with hearing, so there's nothing wrong. But usually, if you are referred for a hearing problem at that age, you have an attentional problem. 
uh, and uh, you should look more carefully at that child. Social interaction and reciprocity, increasing uh, sort of referral research. When I started out in the field 42 uh, years ago, uh, that nobody referred a child for just, uh, you know, I think he's strange or whatever in terms of social interaction. But nowadays, this is actually quite common. Uh, insistence on sameness in the early years, like insisting on just eating certain kinds of food, uh, and this could be a huge problem. That's something that really should uh, get people's attention much more than currently is the case. Uh, and it could be the first sign of autism, it could be the first sign of an eating disorder, very often a combination of the two. And very severe emotional dysregulation uh, lasting for many months uh, is a big problem in many of these children and should be also looked much more carefully at if, if that's the presenting problem. And long-standing sleep and feeding problems more generally, uh, you, you should look more carefully at also. Uh, you don't, maybe these slides could be put up at uh, the Research Autism. Uh, you have a, a separate website where you can put up, yeah. Uh, because you don't need, you know, to, to go through this slide that's coming up here. Um, just uh, believe me when I say that this is what currently is sort of generally agreed on when it comes to ADHD. It's largely genetic and almost always coexisting with other problems such as a positional defiant, development coordination disorder, intellectual disability, tics, so-called OCD is much overrepresented in uh, ADHD and seems to be, uh, at least some people have interpreted it as almost a reaction to the impulsivity uh, that's so typical of some children with ADHD. But some uh, usually quite intelligent children uh, with um, ADHD and impulsivity uh, actually compensate uh, their ADHD by being extremely perfectionistic and, and constantly thinking about checking themselves. Um, so OCD is an underestimated associated problem in uh, people with ADHD. And because people feel this to be well, almost the opposite of ADHD, uh, they don't look for the underlying attentional problems. Autism spectrum disorder, anxiety, and epilepsy are very common uh, comorbid uh, conditions uh, in ADHD. In cases with clinical impairment, and this is uh, the point, cases who are clinically impaired, those are the cases. I mean, otherwise you're not a case. If you're not impaired, you're not a case. You don't need a diagnosis if you don't have some degree of impairment. And actually, sometimes I think it, the best thing anyone in the field could do when any child is presenting to any clinician is trying to find out the level of impairment and then go on to think about what could it be. Uh, is this child really impaired in, in all situations, in school, at home, with his peers, etc.? If that is the case, it's very likely somebody who needs a diagnosis. But increasingly, at least in our clinic, we are seeing cases who are being referred where you think, what's, what's the problem? I mean, of course, this child meets criteria for this and that and that, but very well functioning. Are you sure you really need a diagnosis in that case? I'm not. Uh, we also uh, now know that ADHD can present not just by um, uh, on the basis of genetic factors, but similar results uh, uh, you can see after various types of environmentally produced brain dysfunction with or without a genetic predisposition, such as, as we mentioned, prematurity and fetal drugs and toxins, such as alcohol, infections, and possibly vitamin D deficiency, even though it's unclear whether vitamin D deficiency, just as in autism, has anything to do with the actual cause of, of the problem, or whether it's a secondary phenomenon, or a contributory factor, or just associated with uh, the symptoms. Uh, but certainly, people need to look more carefully into vitamin D deficiency in young children, more generally than is currently the case, and particularly in ADHD and autism, where there is growing data that there is an association with vitamin D deficiency. There is an atypical brain development in children with ADHD and growing evidence that dopamine-dependent reward systems are dysfunctional. I won't go into all of these things other than to say that executive function is very poor, usually, in ADHD. They cannot organize themselves, they cannot uh, plan out their activities, 
They cannot stick to a plan in order to, to achieve a goal. Uh, and they root it. They, they don't uh, think, I have to keep on doing this so that eventually I, I get to the goal. But if you test them on uh, things like the QB test, etc., that doesn't necessarily tell you how impaired they actually are in real life. You can even get a child, and particularly a bright child, with ADHD, testing okay on these executive function tests. But they, if you see them in real life, you realize, oh my god, I mean, there's nothing uh, that they can do that has a plan and organized activity as the underlying sort of uh, theme. Um, so you have to rely very often on the actual description by the parents, by the teachers, and sometimes by uh, the child and the person, him or herself. You don't grow out ever of ADHD. If you meet full criteria for ADHD as a young child and you're clinically impaired at a young age, you don't get totally rid of all the symptoms. Maybe there could be something in some of the studies that have shown that brain development is actually positively and very positively affected by long-term treatment uh, in ADHD. So that children who are treated might actually get, in that sense, normalized. But otherwise, uh, if you don't treat, you're definitely going to have a long-standing problem. Even if you don't meet criteria for ADHD when you're 25 or 35, you definitely have attentional and executive function problems, etc. And what is autism? Or as Mary Coleman and uh, Lorna also uh, accepted, the term that Mary Coleman and myself introduced a number of years ago, we're talking about the autisms rather than autism spectrum disorder. And I do have a problem these days with autism spectrum disorder as a term, because it's not one spectrum. Uh, and you get the sense that they're all on the same spectrum, but they're definitely not on the same spectrum. There are hundreds, indeed, probably many hundreds, of variants of autism. Uh, and so I think it's more appropriate to say the autism is more just autism rather than autism spectrum disorder. But of course, both Lorna and myself, uh, for a long time, you know, referred to it as a continuum or a spectrum. But uh, I think it's time to say, just as the DSM has now introduced autism spectrum disorder, and I think the ICD-11 will uh, also stick with it. Uh, I think we're actually past uh, that level of thinking. Uh, so it's, it's more, uh, I think it's more appropriate and more neutral to just say autism. Uh, because it's a combination of symptoms that we've uh, sort of uh, agreed to recognize as being autism, but it's not one spectrum. It's hundreds, uh, several hundred different spectra. Fragile X autism, for instance, is a different spectrum than tuberculosis autism, which is a different spectrum than etc. Uh, there are almost as many causes as there are cases. Even if we have a, a major gene contributing to autism in uh, things like fragile X, for instance, it, it's quite clear that it cannot be just that gene, uh, because there are clearly cases with fragile X syndrome who don't even have a, more than one symptom of autism. And, and then there are all the others who have huge uh, loads of, of autism symptomatology. Um, I think the big uh, issue here is there is no sharp boundary between autism and autistic traits. There is no sharp boundary between autistic traits and so-called normality. Uh, you don't grow out of it, though. Uh, if you have autism and meet full criteria that are clinically impaired as a child, just as with ADHD, there will be some sort of remnants or what have you of the so-called syndrome. You will still have some autistic features later on. But, I mean, most people stay with their personality, if you will. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a little while. Um, I think virtually all the studies that we have done over the past uh, 15 years have shown us, and we've done a number of long-term follow-up studies of various groups of children with autism. Uh, children with Asperger's, children with so-called autistic disorder or infantile autism, and children with atypical autism or PDD NOS. And they all tell us that if you are clinically impaired, uh, you have more than that so-called syndrome of autism or um, uh, Asperger's. Um, it's the combination 
of the autism phenotype with another disorder that leads to clinical impairment. And it's that which takes them to the doctor or the speech and language therapist, etc. And we now have very good evidence that the, the vast majority of people who have some autistic features never see a clinician for any of that. Um, I won't go into these. Um, this is just a long list of the symptoms that have been shown to be the earliest presenting symptoms of ADHD. And as you can see, there are the symptoms of essence. Uh, you can have any one of these as the presenting symptom. Very often it is actually motor control problems that are the first symptom, but people don't recognize this as a major cause of problems. Uh, but certainly for children had some such problems. And sensory and perceptual problems are also quite common. And if you look at autism, you'll find almost exactly the same list of first presentation. Um, maybe there is a difference in uh, the limited uh, initiation of joint attention seeking that you see in autism, but you probably don't see as much of in ADHD. But the problem currently is nobody has looked at it in ADHD, so it's difficult to say whether it's typical uh, of autism or not. Now, here is where autism only uh, comes into the picture. This is a graph from the Bergen Child Study, uh, which includes uh, almost 10,000 children. We first saw when they were 79, so nobody would agree to do this now unless they were being extra paid, etc. Uh, and even then they wouldn't uh, complete it. But we, we do have this data, uh, and only Japan would otherwise uh, do something like that. So we have similar data from Japan. Uh, but um, unfortunately, so far, it's only been sort of talked about in Japanese, and it's very difficult to, to translate it to, to English. Uh, but this is the result uh, uh, from the Birkin Child Study, not in uh, the Eurovision Song Contest. But uh, what you can see here is that out of the 9,500 plus children, 75% uh, have at least one autistic symptom. So just as Laura was saying, there is a little bit of autism in every single one of us, almost. There are 25% who, at least by the teachers, are not recognized to have a single symptom of autism. But as you can see, there's a drop off uh, gradually, and th there's no hint even, maybe a little bit of hint at the very far right end of this, that there could be a pathological group, as it were, uh, that's nothing to do with normal distribution. Um, but this is what teachers think, this is what parents think. Uh, and parents actually recognize even more autistic symptoms in, in their children than do teachers in those same children. Um, and you can also see that girls are less uh, affected by autistic features than boys. And this is from when we had 19,000 Swedish twins uh, and using another scale called the ATAC which is a telephone interview uh, which asks about all the various types of neurodevelopmental and psychiatric problems uh, children can have. Uh, and you see exactly the same distribution in the twins as in uh, the so-called normal children of the general population. Except you have this little bump at the very far uh, end to the right that are pathological in the sense those are the children who got a diagnosis of autism. So how many people in total are affected by these uh, neurodevelopmental essence problems? Well, at least 10% of all children in the general population, one in 10 of all children, of your own children, uh, of people's children, not people who come to clinics, but 10% of the whole population, at the very least, are affected by ADHD, autism, language disorder, developmental coordination disorder, intellectual disability, etc. And probably about 12% of the boys and 8% of the girls. Not the, the, the overrepresentation in boys is definitely not in the range that we have been talking about, like three, four, five boys for every girl. In, still in clinics, that's what you see in the young group. But as you look into the adult population right now seeking help and getting these diagnoses, actually the number of women it is bigger than the number of men asking for help uh, if they have been unrecognized when they were children. And more than half of this group will have huge problems later in life. The overlap is the, of these conditions uh, with each other is the rule, not the exception. 
up until recently, people didn't even think about the fact that these conditions are always comorbid with other things. They were instead saying, I've, I have done this study on pure ADHD or pure autism or pure this and that. Uh, but I can tell you it's because they didn't look for all the other things that they didn't find them. If you do look for all the other things, you uh, and uh, increasingly people are uh, agreeing that this is the case, that you actually will see the, uh, either shadow syndromes or full syndromes uh, in the other domains. The vast majority of people who do need criteria for any one of these disorders had big problems before the age of five years, but it can sometimes be very difficult with hindsight to actually uh, tease out what those problems were. Girls are still not recognized until adolescence or adult age in the vast majority of cases. Very often they're then recognized as having anorexia nervosa or another eating disorder, or they're recognized as having depression or generalized anxiety. And increasingly also, unfortunately, people are uh, putting things like um, a borderline personality disorder on them, uh, rather than looking out for their underlying neurodevelopmental problems. Uh, and in particular, a large group of, of children who self-mutilate, uh, very often they have an underlying problem of this kind, but people are not looking for it yet. We've done studies in the south of Sweden looking at all uh, 20,000 individuals in, in the psychiatric uh, uh, treatment uh, <coughs> services uh, for adults in Skåne uh, and finding that half or more of all chronic adult psychiatric patients, chronic meaning that they've seen psychiatrists twice, so, um, uh, and having uh, problems that are considered to be of, of any importance. Uh, that, that are actually treated for that problem. Um, and half of that group had either ADHD, autism, or another neurodevelopmental disorder. But only about 1 in 50 of those cases were actually given the diagnosis of autism or ADHD. It was only when people were out there screening the whole group and looking for it and clinically examining them that uh, this relationship was revealed. Uh, I'm not go yeah, uh, no, I'm not going into that here now. Um, but from preschool to adult life, what predicts what in autism? This, I think, is perhaps the most important uh, thing to, to remember uh, after today. In virtually all the studies of outcome long term of autism, when you look at children who are seen in childhood and followed up into adult age, what is it in those studies that? predicted the outcome, uh, good or bad outcomes. Well, it wasn't the autism. It was the language disorder, uh, the language, de the degree of language delay and how long it lasted, the type of language problem, and low IQ. Together, they predicted uh, the vast uh, majority of, of poor outcomes. If you had low IQ and a major language problems before the age of five, you had uh, a poor outcome, uh, and it wasn't the autism load. Uh, you could have extremely high rates of, of autistic features, and yet have a very good outcome many years later. Medical disorders, including epilepsy, uh, of course also related to poor outcome, as does ADHD. If you see executive dysfunction and ADHD problems in a child with autism, that will tell you more about the risk of having a poor outcome than actually having a high autism load. And in the few studies of Asperger's syndrome, we've shown that if you have persistent nonverbal learning disability profile, uh, that also will contribute to a poor outcome. So that if you repeatedly test in childhood with, uh, a, say, WISC profile, um, where you have very good language or verbal, uh, very good verbal. Um, scores but very much poorer performance scores, that tells you that the outcome is unfortunately not likely to be very good. Uh, and we don't know that the interventions that we use will lead to very long-term uh, enormous gains such as some people claim. Uh, we don't know that. I think it's time for people to actually say that, well, uh, at least the naturalistic outcome studies do not suggest the enormous gains that some people claim for 
particularly very intensive intervention. Um, but I think, on a balance, uh, there, there is uh, not direct evidence, but indirect evidence suggesting that early diagnosis makes a difference in terms of outcomes. Uh, so the children who are diagnosed early and getting the right sort of, um, at least, psychoeducation to parents and people around the child, that will make a difference in terms of outcome. I said it again, uh, I'll say it again. The preschool autism load in itself does not predict outcome. So you can have all sorts of top scores on ADOS and ADI, and it doesn't really tell you what's going to happen in the long term, unless you also look at IQ, language, ADHD, etc. Uh, I'm not going into this study in detail, but we've done a study, and I'm now doing a follow-up study of 100 girls who were referred for social and or attention difficulties, and none of them had been diagnosed with autism or ADHD. But the vast majority of men criteria were either one of those disorders. And on follow-up, it is clearly the case that they have been extremely clinically impaired over the years by these conditions, and not so much by what they were also diagnosed with, the depression, anxiety, etc. We know that um, adult anorexia nervosa patients very often have an underlying essence condition, including autism, which has usually been undiagnosed. And we also now know that ADHD is extremely common in obesity. And if you treat uh, uh, the ADHD in obesity, you are usually successful in treating both ADHD and obesity. Um, and it's important that people who work in clinics for obese children actually look for ADHD. Uh, and of course, unfortunately, ADHD is also extremely strongly linked to smoking, and people who cannot give up smoking should all be tested for ADHD. Um, we've been attacked because we did uh, show in a, a uh, uh, systematic review that uh, serial killing uh, is unfortunately associated with the diagnosis of autism or Asperger's. Uh, but in other ways, the criminal records of, of children with autism in the longer term is very low compared to, to what you get in other populations, and particularly with ADHD, who have extremely high rates of, of petty criminality and of uh, the violent uh, uh, crimes that are usually drug-related. Um, I wonder if I have the time to say one word about this study, uh, or these studies, because it's, um, I think, possibly important. We have done a number of studies on adults with schizophrenia and on adults who had a diagnosis in childhood of autism or Asperger's and followed up to the same age as the schizophrenic population. Uh, finding that in people with schizophrenia, uh, there's very often, 40 to 60 percent of the cases, have a childhood history consistent with a diagnosis in the autism uh, range. Um, and if we follow, as we've done in a number of studies, followed up uh, children with um, uh, as Asperger or autism into adult age, we've only ever found one case with typical schizophrenia uh, and um, very, very low rates, under 1%. Many of them have developed micro uh, psychotic episodes over the years, uh, but uh, they have remitted uh, on, on good uh, structured sort of uh, interventions or, or providing uh, a stress uh, reduced environment, but not schizophrenia. And those two things don't go together because schizophrenia is about 1% of the population and autism equally. So if one condition is 50% associated with the other, the other should be associated with the first in the same range. We believe that maybe this is because the autism <coughs> got their diagnosis in early childhood, they got good support, they got environmental uh, good support, their parents and teachers understood them, uh, they were not exposed uh, to extreme levels of stress, and they didn't develop schizophrenia. And we think that is probably, I mean, we cannot prove this, but what else can you suggest in terms of what is the reason why uh, autism doesn't lead on to schizophrenia? Uh, also, autism and ADHD exist in very old age. And we're currently doing a study on Alzheimer's and uh, minor cognitive impairment uh, in the 65 plus uh, old age range. Finding high rates 
<coughs> both conditions, but particularly ADHD. And very often ADHD is misinterpreted as Alzheimer light or a minor cognitive impairment. So uh, finally, I would just like to say uh, how we should plan for the best intervention in these uh, groups. We need to recognize all the problems, not just the autism, not just the ADHD. Depending on what you first see, please look for all the rest of the things as well. Parent training and education plan, perhaps the most important of all, understanding the condition. But one thing that's very often not flagged up is the fact that parents of children with autism or parents of children with ADHD very often have either the same type of problem as the child, maybe in a milder form, um, and if you don't think about that, you cannot adjust yourself to, to the best possible uh, provision of services. Uh, you have to think about these things more often than you usually do in clinical practice. Uh, and many parents, for instance, of children who have ADHD, have ADHD themselves. And unless you help them with that, they're not going to be able to attend to what you say. They're not going to be able to have the executive functions that will provide what you say that they should provide for their child. DCD, uh, oh, ADHD, even in autism, is usually responsive to treatment uh, for ADHD. Uh, various kinds of memory, working memory training, uh, similar treatment, they work almost in the same way, even though, of course, if you think about it, uh, that would affect some of the autistic symptoms, perhaps. You might look a bit more autistic if you're on a stimulant, uh, and you have autism with ADHD. But it doesn't mean that you get worse. It just means the ADHD gets better. So you see the autistic problems uh, more clearly. DCD is, as I mentioned before, usually very responsive to focus training. And people should look for multiple problems in these groups. Epilepsy when present should be treated as a top priority. Sleep disorders also. Violent behaviors can be responsive to uh, low-dose neuroleptics, but only for brief periods of time. Nobody should be on a neuroleptic for a long period of time because they have one of these diagnoses. Do not treat tics per se unless they're extreme. Tics uh, or Tourette's, it, when the children with tics or Tourette's are clinically impaired, it's usually because they also have OCD and ADHD. And those conditions can be treated, but the tics um, I mean, that they should be treated with CBT, if anything. And do not treat autism, per se, with medications. Uh, maybe the methanine and maybe oxytocin preparations in the future will be something that could be tried in, in many uh, people with autism. But currently, the evidence it isn't in to, to suggest that we should be doing that. I still think that psychoeducation, communication enhancement, essence-friendly environment, meaning that if people understand what's going on in the child uh, and can relate to that, that's what's going to help the child and family. Uh, sometimes, at least in ADHD, it's only possible with medications combined with understanding. Uh, uh, so the final slide is ADHD, autism, direct, etc. often uh, overlap to such a marked degree that they need to be seen as a whole category of essence problems. They're often not clearly separable under age five, and even if they are, uh, you need to th immediately think, what else? All children presenting with major essence symptoms need to be followed up, uh, and you can go from one category to another, which is quite common as well. And some of the children that we've seen in our big autism study in Stockholm, where they got intensive versus non-intensive treatment, some of them, as it were, were cured of autism. They, the autism disappeared because they didn't meet ADOS and ADI criteria for autism. But when you looked at those children six years later, they did worse than the other group because they had been left alone. Because they got rid of their autism diagnosis, then people didn't do any more supportive things. Uh, don't say to people, he will grow out of it. If, if you have a major impairment symptom by age five in this domain, it's not going to go away. It's not, the child is not going to, of him or herself, grow out of it. it. We have no time to lose. You have to see the problem and do something about it. So the, um, we, we do need to think about autism as a plus condition when we see patients. It's autism plus. It's always autism plus when you see patients. 
Remember the graph where we see in the general population that 75% of children have one autistic features and 50% have two. Uh, so you, you cannot say that it's um, uh, in itself so clinically impaired. All the children that you see have more than autism. So we should think about it as autism being autism plus. Thank you. Thank you.